this week we continue our studies in ecology with the more specific topics of community ecology and as usual we start off with a story related to our chapter at the beginning the story is about the fighting foreign fire ants red imported fire ants that are native to South America, which arrived in the United States in the 1930s, probably as stowaways on a cargo ship. That makes them what are called invasive species. And like many invasive species, they don't have natural predators that help to control their populations. So they spread and grow in abundance and push out other species. Um, scientists now are looking at ways to try to probably not completely wipe them out but at least control their population numbers by getting other species who can help control them and uh, letting those species go in the areas where the fire ants are predominant. Uh, one of the organisms that they're looking at is actually a type of fly. It's a fly that is a parasitoid. It lays its eggs inside the ant and when the larva uh, emerges it actually feeds on the uh, ants tissues and then it grows into the ants head and when the larva gets big enough it secretes an enzyme that makes the ant's head fall off. Then the fly larva develops into an adult within the shelter of that detached ant head. They've been introduced in several southern states and it seems to be working a bit helping to control that ant population. And ecologists are also exploring other options as well which include pathogenic fungi, or protists that would infect the ants, but not the native ants, of course. Species interactions like this are those between, like the ones between the ants and the flies, um, represent what happens in communities in ecology. A community is all the species that live in a region, different species, as opposed to remember a population is just the same species who are able to interbreed with each other. The type of place where species normally live is a habitat and then all of the species in that habitat constitute a community. They're often nested one inside another. Communities differ in their species diversity. A species diversity has two components, species richness, which is the number of species, and the species evenness, which is the relative abundance of each species. The community structure is dynamic, and species richness and evenness change over time. The community structure can change as the community forms and ages as a result of natural or human induced disturbances with changes in physical factors like climate and resource availability and due to various types of species interaction. These are factors that affect community structure. There's many types of species interactions. They can be mutually beneficial mutually harmful or benefit one while harming the other. Uh, one example is the interaction called commensalism. This is a species interaction that benefits one species and then neither harms nor helps the other species. So you could say the other species is neutral. For example, commensal ferns attached to the trunk of a tree the fern benefits from the light and the tree is unaffected. Here's a nice chart 
that helps keep track of some of the example of species interactions within the chapter, such as commensalism, and lets you know that for species 1 it's helpful, and with species 2 it's neutral. Mutualism is helpful for both. Interspecific competition, harmful for both. Predation, herbivory, parasitism, and parasitoidism is helpful to the one species, yet harmful to the other. And we'll talk about each of those as our notes progress. A symbiosis refers to a relationship in which two species have a prolonged close association. The two species that interact closely for generations can co-evolve, which is an evolutionary process in which each species acts as a selective agent on the other. For symbiosis, one species lives in or on another in a commensal, mutualistic, or parasitic relationship. So for a symbiosis, there's a range of helpful and harmful effects. With commensalism, we've already discussed that one species is helped and the others neutral. Community characteristics, a community consists of all species in a habitat. A habitat's history, its biological and physical characteristics and interactions among species in the habitat affect the number of species in the community and their relative abundance. A mutualistic interaction, this is where both species benefit by taking advantage of one another and neither is harmed. Like for instance, pollinators eat nectar and pollen, and the plants receive pollen from other plants of the same species, thereby increasing their diversity during reproduction. It's a win-win situation for both. In some mutualisms, because of coevolution, Neither species can complete its life cycle without the other. For instance, yucca plants and the moths that pollinate them. The moth matures when the yucca flowers bloom. The mouth parts of the female moth are specialized to collect the yucca pollen. The female flower flies to another flower, pierces its ovary, and lays eggs inside, fertilizing the yucca as she leaves. The moth develops or moth eggs develop in the larva in the ovary of the yucca. For some mutualists, the main benefit is defense, like for instance the sea anemone and the sea anemone fish. The anemone fish has a mucus layer that shields its from, itself from the stinging cells or the nematocysts of the sea anemone. Tentacles of the anemone protect the fish from predators. The anemone fish chases away the few fishes that are able to eat sea anemone tentacles. Mutualistic microorganisms help plants obtain nutrients, like nitrogen-fixing bacteria on the roots of legumes help fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into a useful form for the plant. Mycorrhizal fungi Living in or on plant roots enhance a plant's mineral uptake. And other fungi interact with photosynthetic algae and bacteria in lichens. There are other competitive interactions that go on in a community. For instance, interspecific competition is competition for resources between different species and it adversely affects both species. Each species has an ecological niche. Some people pronounce that word niche. I usually say niche. It's defined by physical and biological factors. The more similar the niches of the two species are, the more intensely they'll compete. An animal's niches include the temperature range that it can tolerate, species it eats, and the places that it can breed. 
A flowering plant's niche would include its soil, water, light, and pollinator requirements. Again, an ecological niche is all of a species requirements and roles in an ecosystem. So you could say your niche is like your job and your habitat is like your address. Here's two types of interspecific competition. Exploitative competition is when two species reduce the amount of resources available to the other by using that resource, such as deer and blue jays completing for acorns. Interference competition is when one species actively prevents another from accessing the same resource, such as one species of a scavenger will often chase another away from a carcass. The effects of competition, the species compete most intensely when a shared resource is the main limiting factor for both. Whenever two species require the same limited, limited resource to survive or reproduce, the better competitor will drive the less competitive species to extinction in that habitat. This is called competitive exclusion. The process whereby two species compete for a limiting resource and the better adaptive one drives the other to local extinction. For example, two paramecium species compete for the same food. They like to eat bacteria. Each species could thrive when grown alone, but when grown together, the better adaptive one, P. aurelia, drove P. caudatum to extinction. Resource partitioning is an evolutionary process by which species become adapted to use a, li a shared limiting resource in a way that minimizes competition. For example, three plant species growing in the same field. The species become adapted in different ways to access the different portions of a limited resource and allows the species with similar needs to coexist with each other. Roots of each species take up water and mineral ions from a different soil depth. That's one way it can happen. It reduces the competition among the species and allows them to coexist. Character displacement. Directional selection, which is a type of natural selection, occurs when species with similar requirements share a habitat and compete for limiting resources resulting in character displacement, such as with the example of the finches and their beak sizes in the Galapagos Islands. The outcome of competition between two species is character displacement with directional selection, shifting the range of variation for one or more traits in a direction that lessens competition for a limiting resource. Predation and herbivory. Predation and herbivory are short-term interactions in which one species obtains nutrients and energy by feeding on another. Predation, one species, the predator, captures, kills, and eats the other species, which is termed the prey. The abundance of prey species in a community affects how many predators that the habitat can support. With some predators, such as web-spinning spiders, the proportion of prey killed is constant. Usually the number of prey killed depends on the time it takes predators to capture, eat, and digest prey. Predator and prey populations may rise and fall in cycles. This is because of co-evolution again with each other, such as the lynx and the snowshoe hare populations rising and falling over a 10-year cycle. We saw this in our population ecology chapter. Predator and prey exert selection pressure on one another. Predators exert selection pressure that favors improved prey defenses. Improved prey defenses, in turn, exert selection pressure on the predators to improve their capture skills and so on. 
So they co-evolve together. Defensive adaptations of prey include hard or sharp parts that make prey difficult to eat and chemicals that taste bad or sicken predators. Other adaptations trick or startle an attacking predator. Well-defended prey often have warning coloration that predators learn to avoid, like the black and yellow stripes of stinging wasps and bees. In a type of mimicry, prey masquerade as a species that has a defense that they lack. For example, some flies that can't sting actually resemble stinging bees or wasps. This makes others avoid them. And again, it's called mimicry, when a species evolves traits that make it more similar in appearance to another species, and it becomes a beneficial trait because others avoid them. Predator adaptations include sharp teeth and claws. Predators and prey may be co-evolved for speed, like the cheetah and the gazelles. And both predators and prey use camouflage, a form of patterning, color, or behavior that allows them to blend into their surroundings in order to avoid detection. With herbivory, the number and type of plants in the community can influence the number and type of herbivores present. Herbivory is when an animal feeds on plant parts. There's two types of defenses against herbivory. Some plants have adapted to withstand and recover quickly from organisms eating it. Other plants have traits like spines and tough leaves or toxins to deter herbivores that would like to eat them. Plant defenses favor adaptations in herbivores. Like, for instance, koalas have special enzymes to break down the toxins in the eucalyptus plants. Some plants and animals benefit by withdrawing nutrients from other species. Some species trick others into providing parental care. With parasitism, one species, the parasite, feeds on another, called the host, without immediately killing it. Endoparasites live and feed inside their host, while ectoparasites feed while attached to the host's external surface. Parasitism, again, is a relationship in which one species withdraws the nutrients from the other, without immediately killing it, but there is harm done to the host. Parasites include a diverse variety of groups from bacteria, fungi, protists, and invertebrate parasites that feed on vertebrates. Lampreys attach to and feed on other fish. Some plants even parasitize other plants. Many parasites are pathogens that cause disease in their hosts. Parasites are adapted with traits that allow the parasite to locate hosts and to feed undetected, like for instance ticks that move toward heat and carbon dioxide, or leeches that release an anesthetic while they suck on the host's skin to obtain blood. Hosts adapt with traits that minimize the negative effects of the parasite, such, a, such as the sickle cell allele that protects humans against malaria. Brood parasites, these are interesting, such as birds that lay their eggs in other species of birds' nests, like cowbirds and cuckoos. Brood parasitism also evolved in some bee species as well. Parasitoids reduce a host population in two ways. The parasitoid larvae withdraw nutrients and prevent the host from reproducing. The presence of larvae leads to death of the host. For instance, like the flies from the beginning of our chapter that are helping to control the red fire ants populations. As many as 15% of all insects may be parasitoids. Again, a parasitoid is an insect that lays eggs in another insect and whose young devour their host from the inside. What a way to go. 
parasites and parasitoids are commercially raised and released in target areas as biological control agents by ecologists. This makes them an environmentally friendly alternative to pesticides. A biological control agent must be adapted to a specific host species and has to be able to survive in that species habitat. Introducing a biological control species into a community is risky because sometimes they could go after non-targeted species. Forms of species interactions. Summing it up here. Commensalism, mutualism, competition, predation, and parasitism are interspecific interactions. They influence the population size of participating species which in turn influences the community structure. Ecological succession. Species often alter the habitat in ways that allow other species to replace them. This is called ecological su succession. The first opportunistic colonizers of new or newly vacated habitats are what you call pioneer species. Um, they have a high dispersal rate, they grow and they mature fast, and produce many offspring. For example, moss, lichens, and some flowering annuals. Primary succession begins when the pioneer species colonize a barren habitat with no soil, like for instance a new volcanic island or land exposed by retreat of a glacier. Pioneers Pioneer species help build and improve the soil, which will pave the way for the next run of species. Seeds of later species grow in mats of pioneers. Organic wastes and remains accumulate and help other species take hold. Later successional species often shade and eventually displace earlier ones. In secondary succession, a disturbed area within a community recovers. It occurs in abandoned agricultural fields and in burned forests. Species composition of a community changes frequently and unpredictably. Random events can determine the order in which species arrive and affect the course of succession. Example, in 1980, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The presence of some pioneers helped later arriving plants become established. Other pioneers kept the same late arrivals out. The factors in community composition. Three factors affect species composi composition in community. Physical factors like soil and climate. Chance events such as the order in which the species arrived to the area and the extent of disturbances in that habitat. For long-term change in communities, the array of species in a community changes over time. Although the exact outcome of the changes is difficult to predict, when a new community forms, the early arriving species often alter the habitat in a way that facilitates their own replacement. Com uh, species interactions and community instability. Loss or addition of even one species, like a keystone species, may destabilize the number and abundances of species in a community. A, key to a keystone species is a species that has a disproportionately large effect on community structure. Hence their name, Keystone Species. In an experiment, sea stars in a rocky intertidal zone in California. Sea stars prey mainly on mussels, and sea stars were removed from experimental plots. With the sea stars gone, mussels took over crowding out seven other species of invertebrates. Conclusion, the sea stars are a keystone species. They normally keep the number of prey species high by preventing competitive exclusion by mussels. 
things, the impact of a keystone species can vary between habitats that differ in their species array. Like, for instance, periwinkle snails. In tide pools, periwinkles eat the most competitive algal species, allowing less competitive species to survive. In the lower intertidal zone, the periwinkles eat the less competitive algae, giving dominant algae an advantage. Some species adapted to being disturbed are at a competitive disadvantage if the disturbance does not occur. For instance, areas that are subject to periodic fires. Some plants produce seeds that germinate only after a spire or after a fire or respout quickly after a fire. Because different species respond differently to fire, the frequency of fire affects their competitive interactions. Like toyon resprouts from roots after a fire. In the abundance of occasional fire, toyons are outcompeted by other species. Or excuse me, in absence of occasional fire, toyons are outcompeted by other species. I've also heard that with jack pines, that fires help to open their seeds. In indicator species. They're the first to do poorly when conditions change, so they can provide an early warning of environmental degradation. For instance, trout are highly sensitive to pollutants and cannot tolerate low oxygen levels. They can help tell us when something is wrong in a body of water. Exotic species can dramatically alter a natural community. They're also called invasive species. More than 4,500 exotic species have become established in the U United States. Kudzu, native to Asia, is overgrowing trees across the southeast U.S. Gypsy moths, native to Europe and Asia, feed on oaks through much of the U.S. And nutrias, native to South America, are abundant in freshwater marshes of the Gulf states. Summing it up with the species effects on community stability, removing a species from a community or adding one to it can have a dramatic effect on other species. Some species are adapted to disturbances and a change in the frequency of disturbances can affect their number. Biogeographic patterns and community structure. We've looked at biogeography before when we talked about evolution. Biogeography is the study of how species are distributed in the natural world. Species richness correlates with differences in sunlight, temperature, rainfall, and other factors that vary with latitude, elevation, and water depth. Again, species richness of an area is the number of species. Latitudinal patterns, species richness is usually greatest in the tropics and declines from equator to the poles. Tropical latitudes intercept more sunlight, receive more rainfall, and their growing seasons longer. Tropical communities have been evolving for a long time, and species richness may, may be self-reinforcing. More plant species leads to more herbivores, which leads to more predators and parasites. Island patterns. According to the equilibrium model of island biogeography, the number of species living on any island reflects a balance between immigration rates for new species and extinction rates for established ones. Colonization rates depend on the distance between an island and a mainland source of colonists, which is the distance effect. An island size affects its, rich, its species richness. An area effect. Our, here's our key terms. The equilibrium model of island biogeography predicts the number of species on an island based on the island's area and distance from the mainland. The area effect affects immigration and extinction rates. Larger islands have more species than small ones. The distance effect 
affects immigration rates. Islands close to a mainland have more species than those far away. Global Patterns in Community Structure Biogeographers identify regional patterns in species distribution. They have shown that tropical regions hold the greatest number of species and that characteristics of islands can be used to predict how many species an area will hold. Revisiting the fighting foreign fire ants. The red imported fire ants did not evolve in North America, so there's few predators, parasites, or pathogens that hold their numbers in check. Again, they're called either invasive species or exotic, exotic species. Global climate change is expected to help the red imported fire ants extend their range in the U.S. 